Alaska Saavedra. I am a sophomore BCE student, and my role for the conference was marketing director. So this first panel of the day is street art for social change. The panelists include Jeanette Beckman, a British-born photographer who began her career in the punk rock era, working for music magazines, The Face and Melody Maker. She has shot, ba she has shot bands from The Clash to Boy George, as well as three police album covers. She has published six books, including the mashup collaboration with iconic New York graffiti artist, reinterpreting her image for hip hop images. Her new monograph covering 40 years of photography, Rebels from Punk to Dior, was published by Drago in November 2021. Jeanette continues to chronicle subculture as well as photography and campaigns for brands like Dior and Levi's. She's represented by the Hay Klein Gallery, and Jeanette, Jeanette's photography has influenced trends in fashion, and her courageous attitude has gained her much success. We invited Jeanette to share her journey and shed light on how she enfranchised herself through her career. Our second panelist is Roger Gassman. He's a collector, curator, graffiti historian, and urban anthropologist. He started writing graffiti as a teenager in Bethesda, Maryland, and later per parlayed his love for it in a, to a legitimate career as a trusted mediator between underground art scenes and mainstream culture. In 1997, Gassman published a graffiti magazine, While You Were Sleeping, which evolved from a DIY production in his bedroom into a full-fledged magazine internationally distributing over 80,000 copies per month by 2021. Later, Gassman founded and co-published Window Magazine with artist Shepard Prairie and has since created 60 high sought after art books with numerous international translations. Gassman co-created art in the streets at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles in 2001, in 2011, it's my bad. The first international comprehensive survey of graffiti and street art with an attendance of over 250,000 people. The exhibit survey of graffiti and street art with, with an attendance of 250,000 people. The exhibit, granted graffiti, the exhibit granted its credibility alongside other prominent genres. Roger is an excellent example of a creative who captured social movements that otherwise would have been forgotten. We invited him to share his success and enlighten us on how he enfranchised himself to his work. Our third panelist is April Walker. She's a fashion designer, culture shifter, and entrepreneur who helped create a multi-billion dollar industry called streetwear. Her brand, Walker Wear, was one of the first to kick in distribution doors, command millions in sales, and dress icons such as Tupac, B.I.G., and Aliyah. Walker is an author and adjunct professor at NYU's Clive Davis, is featured on Netflix, and is a recipient of several fashion awards. Her work has exhibited internationally. At 21, she opened her first custom shop called Fashion and Effect, making clothes from MC Light, Shaggy, Audio 2, and Shinehead. She also launched a styling division responsible for numerous images that have appeared in countless videos and photos, including Wu-Tang Clan, Run DMC, Queen Latifah, Aliyah, Naughty by Nature, and more. The brand has been featured in many motion pictures and television shows. We invited April to reveal her secret to successfully enfranchising herself in the world of fashion. This panel will be moderated by Lena Geraldo, a Colombian-born, Boston-based designer, interactive media artist, and storyteller with a background in co-design, civic media, data, art, and technology. She's currently an assistant professor at Emerson in the journalist department. I'm very honored to introduce the Street Art for Social Change panel. Thank you so much for your patience. You know, I, I follow up with Paul after two years of Zoom. You figure out with everything we have it already and facts, but so thank you for your patience. It is an honor to have such a distinguished speakers today in this panel. Um, I want to introduce my name. I actually don't know if you can see me, uh, Janet, Roger, and April. I think you can. I'm not sure. I just see you, so that's wonderful. Yeah. It's so nice to have you here. You are an amazing inspiration for many generations, so it's definitely I am humble and honored to have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, we have a few questions. We, the hope and the goal of this uh, conversation is to just really learn more about your influence with the community, what do you learn from the community, and that kind of social impact that you really have bring historically for where we are and where we stand right now. So um, I wanna, I don't, and before we even we go to the questions, I don't know if you wanna introduce yourself. We know, we know who you are, they just introduced yourself, but if you have any kind of first sentence that you wanna tell to our um, audience here, or anything that you wanna, and start the conversation. I'd like to say thank you for having us today. And I'm really excited about being on the panel with these two great human beings and these creatives. And I'm just looking forward to sharing whatever we have in terms of our experience and gems. Thank you, April. 
And uh, I'd like to say, same thing as April, thank you for having us. And, uh, you know, as a photographer, I'm honored to have worked with both of these guys. And um, April and I did a photo shoot just right before the pandemic, which was pretty awesome. And Roger and I are gonna collaborate on something. I think it's happening in May. So it's really cool to have this meeting. And yeah. Roger, I don't know, over to you, Roger. <laughs> you basically just said it all. Um, thank you for having us. I'm happy to be here with, with you all. And I've spent my life just wanting to make cool shit and put it out there and hope the world likes it. And educate through it and thankfully we've been able to keep doing it and we're gonna i think all talk about similar things like that today that sounds wonderful thank you very much so i'm just going to start with a few questions but i really want to i'm going to also have and receive questions from the audience as we go on um but one of the first questions is for all of you and um, any of you are free to answer if you feel like what is your connection to your respective communities is some thread that you all share you are inspired by your community. Can you each speak as how to your community shape and shape your work and art? Um, well, I could, I could talk. I mean, I, I was born in England, in London, and I came here in like 1983, and hip hop was happening all around. And the hip hop community in New York which I, I didn't know anybody, they just welcomed me. And it was an amazing connection. And, you know, I got very involved with all of it, the music, the culture, the, the poetry, the style, everything, the streets. And I was living in New York downtown. And I feel like as somebody from another country, you know, I was just welcomed into the community and years later, it's led to incredible collaborations for me. Thank you, Janet. I'm not sure you, and maybe April wants to follow up. I think for me, um, my connection to uh, people and community, um, I think the community, I connect with people and so it's, it's, it's just a natural evolution, right? In my community first. And then, then from the art and the, in the creative aspect is a global community. So for me, it's just been this like circle that's keeps, keeps growing and keeps growing. And I think energy feeds energy. And so we attract who we are, you know what I mean? And what we are and where we're going. And so I think with that vision and that passion, it feeds energy and that energy comes back to us. So I think that, you know, um, I'm also a person that is spiritual. And so I believe that um, we're all giving gifts for a reason, right? And so those gifts that we have are not to be hoarded, but to be shared. And I think that, you know, that's what we do. I think as creators, we share, we're just pouring out what we have and sharing that with the world. So in that way, I think we connect with community and, you know, um, you know, we're here to make each other better. I like that energy feeds energy. It's true. Um, so much of what I do and so much of the people I still work with, uh, I was friends with when I was 14 or 15 years old or I was aware of their work when I was 14 or 15 years old, running around in the early 90s, writing graffiti, going to punk rock and hardcore shows uh, right up in Washington, DC, and then all over the country very quickly after that. And I met such a great community of people through graffiti, through going to punk rock and hardcore shows that and a lot of them were a little bit older than me. A lot of them were photographers. A lot of them ended up going to become designers. Um, fashion, in the arts world, et cetera. And I just always stayed in touch with them. Uh, you know, that's a whole other long story of trading photos and traveling and things that uh, a lot of people don't do anymore. But, you know, through honestly the trade, the photo trading community of here's a few photos of what's happened in my city, I get a few from yours. Mm -hmm. I just built a huge network and friend group. And as my life continued to go on, I just became more and more interested in the history in so many of the cities, especially my city. And that led to the projects and that kind of just led to the extended community and the community that I respected. And thankfully 
I got their mutual respect back and we work together to make everyone's projects bigger and better and always remembering that we have to respect the community we're working with and make sure the community we're working with see something in a new white light or something that gives them you know a, a great emotion because of course everyone in the community usually thinks they know everything um so how do you keep them excited and engaged and at the same time you know respect the general audience and the general public because of the communities we all love here and respect and come from i think uh, the three of us if we don't figure out how to reach outside of that too we're not you know we're, we're, we're not doing any education and anything outside of what we're doing and stay circular so you know my community has shaped me by continuing to kick me in the butt and honestly tell me when they don't think i'm doing something right call me out and keep it going and it's all just based off of you know friendship or friendships or people i was aware of you know from then to now and friends of friends there's so many beautiful things that you have said but just the energy feed energy and we respect the community and the community really we have how we actually promote that story and i think that's fantastic and i want to kind of bring a little bit and bring where we're happening right now in in the present, we are living in a moment where marginalized commuter communities are reclaiming their narrative. And in your work, you create narrative by amplifying and humanizing the hip hop culture. How can this apply to the current and social artistic atmosphere? <laughs> I know it's a big question, but I do pretty much change a lot of the narrative. So I, I would love to hear some of your thoughts. So I, I have this saying and this thought that I stick with, and we, it goes back to community. And I think that it we're independent, yet we're interdependent, right? And at the same time, um, I, be, I strongly believe, and we everyone, Jeanette is a great example of saying, like she's collaborated with both of us, right? Um, and I believe lateral cooperation creates vertical movement. So, you know, if we all did that, the world would be a better place, you know, and, and a chain is only as strong as its links. So like, that's the thought process for hip hop in the work that I do. Um, and I'm one person, but I'm not extraordinary. I'm just doing some extra work, you know? But if we all rolled up our sleeves, like everybody on this panel is, and so many other human beings, but it it takes the, the world right now because the world is in shit shape. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, go, I'm sorry, Janet, please. No, no, I was just gonna say, you know, she's right, the world is in shit shape. And, you know, during uh, lockdown, you know, 20, I was lucky enough to be able to document a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement, which was just happening kind of right around my house. So it really was community because I live in New York City and I'm sort of near Washington Square and Union Square and City Hall where all the demonstrations were. And I think hip hop was a huge influence on Black Lives Matter. You could see it and you could see it. Hip hop influencing and it changing politics. I mean, those demonstrations have changed the world and the world view. And I, th I think it's so powerful. And it, it's a really good example of how community got together in a time of extreme critical uh, upheaval and just horrible things happening. They still are. You know, I feel like that was a really good example of community. And, you know, a lot of it came from hip hop to getting together for change, for good change. And that's, that's a great thing. Thank you. you know, I, you know, I grew up listening to punk rock and hardcore. I was in Chicago in the early nineties. I'm at a late night party. Um, way too young to be there and a bunch of people come up to me and ask me if I break and I'm like I have no idea what the hell you're talking about and they're you know talking about break dancing I'm like oh, okay graffiti break dancing this culture I get it like it didn't exist outside of like my core group of friends so that really kicked me in the butt and made me see everything as a larger community um, at that point it just kind of clicked and uh very quickly after that um I became just more aware of the general community and helping each other. And to me, 
hip hop has definitely not been in, in my studies as much as April and Jeanette, but I've come to admire more and more of it, become more and more friendly with people that have created and continue to create. And I look at it so much more than just the, the you know, the elements people look at. It's fashion, it's lifestyle, it's community. And it is, an, it's a community and it's a lifestyle much more than you can say it's rapping, break dancing or anything like that. And I think that's one of the things that thankfully in the last few years, I think has come much more up and uh it's it's gone away from more that here's a t-shirt with four elements this is a community and whenever i talk about it because i don't feel you know i'm uh a part enough of it to be able to you know speak on this or this I and mean, i know historical things and all of that but what i've continued to admire and when i do get asked is hey this isn't this element or this or this it's a community of a lifestyle that is very important and uh you know i don't want to compare it to like a religion in a sense but like it is something that is celebrated admired and you know could be looked at in different ways by different people around the world well what great the answers I we really are inspired, and I think yes, really, it's not it's not a religion, but it's really something that it bring you up and, and it bring conversations that it need to happen. I think this question is more for April, and I want to talk a little bit about Walker Wear. Um, you, we could really describe you as a classic disruptor. Um, and what was your intent? And and if it was, do you have a strategy for doing it? You started. I think that, um, so I think that I probably have, looking back, I probably always had a fighting spirit, but I don't mean fighting like fighting in the streets. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, just, you know, I grew up, so I'm, I'm from, I grew up, um, post Vietnam, like the seventies, you know, and then going into the eighties, like we go into the crack era, we come out the Nixon era and, and, you know, a lot of different things. I've seen a lot of different phases and I, and I grew up in New York. So, um, I've seen a lot of disparities. I've seen a lot of, um, inequality in the world. I've seen a lot of injustice. And then I've seen a lot of beauty. I've seen a lot of good things. I'm lucky enough to have grown up with parents who made me go to the museums on the weekend and do voice lessons and dance lessons. I can't sing a lick, lick. but you know, just like all of these things, modern dance and in all the arts and, and music and fashion, my father was in that. So I grew up watching my father in the music business. He was managing jazz produced of uh, jazz um, artists, some, McCoy Tyner and, you know, a lot of younger people won't know, but a lot of legends now, you know, that have paved the way for a lot of jazz artists now. And I just watched him ride that roller coaster of beans and rice to having high moments to low moments to high to low, but he was doing what he loved. And so I think that, um, I don't know if I looked at it as disruption then, but what I did look at it as disruption was hip hop because I was a teenager and I can remember, um, I can remember so many things, but really when Sugar Hill Gang made the radio like pop music it, on, on all the national stations and I, I thought like this is a real moment for us, not like a trend, but it, it was like a tsunami coming and I could feel it through the energy. You could see it on the trains. I could go to the parks and, and dance and, and listen to Bobito playing in Harlem or wherever in, this, in, the, in the playgrounds. You know what I mean? It was just like this feeling of tribe members that you found that understood change needed to come and it was coming whether you liked it or not. And I wanted to be on that train because I wanted to be part of that, you know? So for me, it was uh, just figuring out how I was gonna be a part of it 
Um, and then at the same time, I was a hustler. Like I was, I was selling pots and pans as a kid. I was teaching gymnastics. I was doing every and all the things, you know, always trying to figure out how I knew I didn't want to work for someone, but I was, I was in college for communications and for business. So I reverse engineered. I actually can remember the moment when the light bulb went off and I was at the Apollo at Amateur Night and I went to Dapper Dance after. And I just saw this man who I could identify with that was making for all of you, most of you probably know Dapper Dan, but if you don't, he is legendary. He is like everything. He's paved the way for so many of us in streetwear. And uh, he basically was making at that time, everything from Gucci, Louis Vuitton, and the likes, Fendi, everything, but better than them. Like he was, he was making his own fabric. And then, and that was like poetry, right? Because it was like, at that time, if you went in Gucci for a lot of us, if you looked a certain way, you were being followed around the stores. You were being, um, you were being treated. I mean, we just saw the rant, whoever is into hip hop and saw Jim Jones rant, it's still happening. You know, so it's like for us, for me to see him serving the community and making those styles that spoke to our tribe members, it was a moment and the light bulb said, you know what, at that time, you guys, the boroughs were so different. So Brooklyn was different than Harlem. Harlem was different than Queens. You know, it was all very, very, very different. We didn't have the internet. You didn't have MTV. So I just wanted to come home and make things for my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And I wanted to speak to hip hop and pour out what we were feeling because there was nothing in the stores that we could go and buy at that time. So I wanted to serve my tribe and, and really be a part of hip hop. And I knew I could make money doing that. So all those things rang truth to me and were in sync. And I was like, I can do this. And so really being naive to fear really helped me and started me, you know? And that, that's really how it started. I, I was part of that disruption because I believed in hip hop and, and I really saw something that wasn't there because I felt it. But amazing that you also start this conversation talking about love and something that you're passionate about and how you start kind of finding this root through that passion and really finding this pain point or this need that it was, that it wasn't there at the time. So that's, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, this question is for Janet. And, and, and you were in places documenting people and also you were humanizing them and you were not asking them to pose, you were really kind of capturing those souls, but at the same time you were documenting a billion dollar industry when others didn't see value on them. And, 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 and you mentioned in some previous interviews that I think that you were trying to find, you get into the advertising that they didn't see the value, so you were looking for these small places and that's how it started. I'm curious what do you see at that time um, and what do you, inspire? Where do you move to keep going? Well, you know, I came from London and I, I had sort of when I came out of art school, I always knew I wanted to be some kind of artist and there didn't seem to be any other choice to me. And, um, you know, when I came out, punk was just happening and there were all these streets that looked so different from you know, England is very steeped in tradition and suddenly there was this revolution going on right in front of my eyes and I had my camera and I just started documenting it. And, you know, then I, I worked for music magazines and photographed the bands, but I always photographed the fans as well because I felt like it was so much about, well, you know, the whole thing about community, you know, one minute you'd be a fan of a band and during the punk era, you could just jump up on stage and start thrashing a guitar and you didn't need to be an accomplished musician, you know, to do that. So, you know, you'd be a star and it didn't, the great thing about punk and I feel like hip hop as well, you didn't have to look, you know, like a model. You could be like a chunky guy with three teeth missing and, you know, whatever, and bad haircut, whatever. And you could be a superstar, like, 
Shane McGowan or somebody like that. And I love that. And the same thing for the women, you know, it was very non-traditional and it was definitely, it was the same thing, you know, as punk because things were bad in New, in London when we kept, the economy was terrible. There was no future, there was no jobs. And then I saw my first hip hop show in 82 and it was like, um, it was really like a renaissance moment for me because here were these people, instead of punk, which was in a way a bit of a kind of negative movement, everybody was like saying everything's shit and we're gonna fight it. Here were all these incredible people, I didn't even know who they were, who were so positive and they were making art and they were dancing and they were doing everything on stage at the same time. And, the style was just amazing and really, their attitude was so upbeat. And I moved to New York and there was this, you know, April's right, there was this kind of energy there that kind of, we can do anything, we're gonna make change and things are crap, but we're gonna talk about it. You know, songs like The Message where you're talking about you know, junkies in the alley with a baseball bat. That's kind of what it was like, rats, you know, rats. That I was living in what's now Tribeca and it was just a deserted warehouse area and it was kind of dangerous, but there was this energy of change and movement and art, like April said, art on the trains. I mean, you couldn't avoid it. It was right in your face. You take a train as some kid with a, a boom box and me as a photographer, I, I think it's, you know, it was, I guess it's a compulsion, a passion, an addiction. I can't help myself. I just want to document it. Whatever it is, is going on. That's kind of how I feel. I just want to record it. And you're right. I don't pose people in my pictures because I, I'm all about take me to where you're from, show me what you're about, and I'm going to try and take a picture of it. And you know, that's kind of how it's always been for me. And, and it still is. I just did a photo shoot of this young guy called Jaharis. He's um, a jazz drummer. And um, he's just, he's working with, I work with this collective called Rainbow Blonde. It's a jazz uh, collective run by Jose James and Tali Billing. And this kid's never had a photo taken before. I mean, he's not a kid. I don't know how he's young, but we managed to get some great photos. I was just like, you just be you. You know, we walk around in the neighborhood. How do you feel about this spot? Yeah. You know, I took him to A1 Records, which is a used record store. And he's like looking through all the records. I got pictures of him. And I'm thinking, I don't, I mean, it's kind of people somehow, it's about respect. It's exactly what April said. It's about respect and gaining people's trust. And, um, Right now I'm working on a project uh, called Women Who Rock about, it's gonna be a TV series. I got to photograph somebody last week that I have been crazy fan of, made of Staples <laughs> since 1972. I know, I, I was so kind of, I was fanning out, let's be real, I was fanning out. And this woman is all about joy and love. And I'm, I have five minutes to take a picture of her and capture a portrait. And, you know, hopefully I did it. And then, you know, I, I, I just, it's that thing that you talk to somebody, you have five minutes to get their trust and get them to show you who they are. And, and you know, that's, that's just the way I go. And I'm still super, you know, I have to take pictures. There's nothing else for me to do. Well, what you just said of you have five minutes to gain their trust and get it done. I mean, I think it's it's the same here, probably the same so much for April and what you've done is you as as we all meet people, it's you know that first thing, especially in these what we're so much subcultures or subcultures of subcultures that are now these huge businesses. But, you know, as we're still so much supporting and respecting uh, people that, you know, really got started and moving it and the new people that are going, it's, yeah, you still are finding, I'm still finding myself all the time. I have five minutes to, to sell it almost. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. To let someone into, you know, to allow to, for someone to let me into their life, like and they they've never met me before. It's a huge thing. I mean, 
It's so intimate. It's so intimate. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge thing. That connection is so important. Uh, and all your work is about that, that connection and trust. And you, the three of you use different media and you represent it throughout the, your years of work, which I think is quite amazing. And something that I want to kind of, kind of uh, highlight from the, the, the last two questions is that change the movement from the messiness, find that beauty and move forward. And I think you both say something, we just have to get to it. And we, you have to kind of grasp the soul and we have to really make the best of it. And we, we have to be part of the change. And I think that's pretty fabulous. And thank you for sharing this. Um, Roger, we describe you as a urban anthropologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you have done an amazing work really when you start documenting graffiti. You start really saying, we have to take, these are making story. The communities are telling the stories and you start documenting this. You start documenting the graffiti culture, celebrating the art and the beauty. When many of you, many of everyone, so as a vandalist, the police were trying to track the people down, kids were going to getting arrested. So how do you make this really feasible, like make this is history, this is real, how do you make it valuable for the society? How do we make it valuable for the society? Uh, I, I think that goes back, honestly, to some of the things uh, I said. It's making sure you respect the community, but reach outside of the community. Um, I knew that having two spray paint ads wouldn't matter, no matter if they're the first spray paint ads ever, but having 300 spray paint ads tells a story. Um, having two photos of early graffiti in the city I grew up in is great, but it doesn't do anything, um, you know, in the big picture. So it's being able to make friends, make acquaintances, make partners and gain trust. And once you have that trust, you can start amassing collections. And that's one of the things I've really tried to continue to do um, and continue those relationships. Um, because if you don't have the people inside speaking positively about you, a few people are always gonna talk shit. If you're uh, doing your job right, then there's always gonna be some haters. If there's not haters, you're probably doing your job wrong. Um, so, you know, you can't let that get you down. Um, you just need to kind of smile and keep moving and not engage, uh, just just keep it going. I, I've definitely learned. Uh, but in, in the end, yeah, it's amassing the collection and being excited about it, archiving it, and showing things at the right time and not showing things at the right time. Always saying, well, this is my fee. I'll give you this for this, nothing else. It's feeling people out, meeting people, understanding what the project is and understanding that there's different ways to do things, different ways to get things out. Of course, if it's a project where someone is really gonna make a lot of money, talk to them about it because your archive is valuable and you had to spend time and energy to get your archive done. But, you know, there can be value in things for everyone that are often you don't see at the top. So I always even experiences when I represent and manage several different artists. So many of the times, I don't know, 95 out of 100 requests we get don't go anywhere. But I talk to a lot of those people at those agencies, at those brands, you name it. And I do my best to educate them, too, of why we're charging this for this. So next time when they reach out to an artist that might be a friend or me again when they're at another company in three years, hopefully they've listened and learned something and I hear what their objectives are and maybe I learned something from them too. Um, in, in the end, create your archive, sit on your archive, but don't sit on your archive forever. Get it out there <laughs> and yeah. you know, res respect your community, but think bigger picture or your community is just going to stay stagnant and only creating for each other. During the last 20 years, have you seen any change in the graffiti community or how it's been represented and accepted in society? I, you, you, you've been really, you know the beginnings, you know the early stages, so it would be interesting to see your perspective. I think we can say for hip hop, punk rock, so many forms of fashion, um, and especially graffiti, it, the last 20 years has been unlike anything I'd seen before. Uh, you know, in the early 2000s, when things were starting to really go back into the gallery and get some buzz, get some dollars, brands were looking, uh, a lot of designers were starting to really make a name for themselves. We were like, hey, when's this going to burst? A few years later, when's this going to burst? A few years later, when's this going to burst? 
And what we all started to realize was a lot of us had gotten a lot of us that grew up in the 90s, in a sense that, you know, came up seeing tattoos everywhere, came up, um, you know, being able to download music, like things like that, you know, people in their early 30s now are creative directors of companies, you know, they know cell phones, they know technology, you know, they know tattoos, they know, you know, Napster when they were kids, like everything, everything was right there. So, you know, graffiti and street art has exploded. Street art has become the safe word in a sense. And there's three pieces of the culture. There's street art, there's graffiti, and there's murals. Um, murals are that we see, it's a massive culture. And one of the reasons the culture has gotten so big is gentrification developers going into neighborhoods and saying, we're gonna put murals here because it's gonna make everything look okay. It really does work. Then the coffee shop opens and this opens. I mean, we can name so many neighborhoods and you know, we could sit here and have hours of conversation of the pros and cons of that. But in the end, there's public art and I love public art. And so many of these muralists are taking cues from graffiti writers and they're taking cues from street artists. Um, and they're often just branded street artists, even when, yes, their work is in the street. So you could say that, but, you know, to me, a street artist is someone who's put in their work illegally over time and really built it up. Uh, and a muralist is a muralist and a graffiti artist is a graffiti artist. And now it's just kind of like this blended world. And, you know, one of the things I want to do is continue to educate that there's differences, but at the same time, there's public art, it's everywhere. Graffiti has exploded. And right now, my job, I feel, is to try to keep the authentic graffiti, the authentic street art towards the forefront as much as I can and tell those stories. I'll never be able to tell them all. So I hope we inspire other people to get out and tell those stories. Thank you. I do love to mention the word gentrification because it really is being becoming also a tool. And many of the places that you're coming from have changed drastically in the last 30, 40 years, and it really can define what you do now. But so that kind of leads me to the next question, which is, um, in a way or another, the corporate machine has co-opted to movements that you helped to start. And how can see you kind of unrunning that belt that is say, and regain that control? And how can you can really go back to the control of all this movement that now is being advertised, that is being included in the new language, when the new media advertising? Um, I'll grab, I mean, own your story and trust who you work with. I mean, it's simple as that, you know, don't be, don't be so sheltered and afraid of the new media and make new friends and ask a lot of questions and get some paperwork, write it down. Thank yeah. you. I mean, I think you're right. You know, trust who you work with is a big thing. <laughs> I mean, I was lucky enough to do a, a worldwide campaign from Levi's in 2018. And that was like a dream for me. And that was because their creative director is this wonderful man, Chad Hinsley. He loved my hip hop stuff and he loved my street portraits and he loved the punk stuff. I mean, he understood it. And he pretty much let me, you know, we threw block party in, I guess we threw a block party in uh, Bed-Stuy. We threw actually one in Jersey city too. And it, you know, he brought in all the OGs, you know, he had Stretch and Bob and he had break dancers and everybody was just wearing Levi's t-shirts. We street cast. And I thought it was a really brilliant way to bring old school to new school. Do you know what I mean? And get the culture out there. And you're really right about sharing. Like you should archive your stuff, but you should share it. I know a lot of photographers are really uh, gun shy of putting their work on the internet or they don't want to have websites in case someone steals their work. But, you know, that work belongs to the world. And you're right, educating and sharing is like one of the most important things right now. And like working with brands, if you find a good brand to work with is a great way of sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, I think you guys have both said pretty much everything. I'll just add, um, for me, as an independent, um, this di word disruption has become, disruptors has become such a buzzword, but I think I've always lived that in the sense of living outside of my comfort zone, in a discomfort zone, 
So I feel like one, once things are getting too settled within my creative space, um, it's time to disrupt. I feel like that about everything. Like even I'm, I work out like, so if I get too routine-y, I wanna disrupt that and do find something else, you know, to keep myself engaged, to keep myself creative. Um, and so when I think about that, as it relates to my art and my fashion and my creative helmet, so to speak, I think about, I'm always thinking about how I can story tell right now, because everything for me is storytelling through fashion. So um, whether it's a narrative about something I'm passionate about that's going on in the world, or whether it's about telling my legacy, or whether it's about sharing, sharing and collaborating with another artist and sharing their story, story right? Um, but alignment is so important because I think that I've been able to go the distance because I remain true to myself. And so in that um, partnering with other people that are still in the tribe. So that's if it's a person, if it's an entity, whatever it is, the mission has to be aligned with my value system or closely enough where it, it for this project, project, it would make sense for this phase of my mission right now and what my artistry is doing. I hope that makes sense, you know, and the value system, because as a brand, right, you have to protect your brand. So if you do a collaboration with another company that doesn't represent your value system and is incongruent with who you are as a brand, that's problematic because now you're making your tribe question your value system, you know? So those, those, that's how I think of things when I think of them. Um, I also um, think all opportunities aren't opportunities. And then I think some opportunities are great opportunities. So discernment is really important as well. And I think that we have to be as creatives willing to live in a discomfort zone period like we have never lived in a time where time is moving so fast and if you are thinking about today you're late already like you need to be thinking about your art as it's living in the metaverse as it's living what's coming you know what i mean and thinking in that space and the older we get i think the more challenged or the more seasoned we get we're challenged to stay right there because the advantage we have is experience the work we need to do is to still dig through the crates and stay to keep unlearning and to keep learning, to keep learning, to keep learning and to keep collaborating with other creatives that teach us, right? So I think that it's a mesh of all of those things. And if you can find a big brand or these big corporate brands that really are aligned with your mission, let them amplify your goals. It's just, it's about the world right now. So it's a global community. So I just think it's a, it's a, a mix of magic. I wanted to add one thing. Um, as I've gotten older, I've learned that as I think all of us on this panel being more creatives, we've probably all learned. I know I learned the business as I went through trial and error, and I'm still making mistakes. People I work with make mistakes. People that want to use images of ours that don't credit them right make mistakes. And instead of writing people off right away for making mistakes, I've definitely learned to try to give somebody a chance to fix their errors once in a while instead of writing them off. So I think that's an important lesson I've learned in trying to move forward uh, because so many times we're working with people that aren't used to understanding, well, why do you need a photo credit for that? Why do you need that? Because this is so new to them, including a lot of the brands with how they treat and respect the artist because it's not what they're always used to. Um, they're often just used to you know, getting a pattern from a pattern designer and yeah. moving forward with no name attached to something. So um I'm trying not to be as um, hot-headed level-headed and uh listen to an apology or an understanding once in a while and give somebody another chance has been important of course cut people off if they totally fuck up but, you know that's that's an important piece of the puzzle i think in keeping it moving is, yeah, is letting people make errors absolutely because we all make them and and i think that's where that energy comes in and having the discernment to understand that, you know what I mean? And you can feel when someone's making an, a mistake or when they're just being an asshole. So discernment <laughs> is key. Mm -hmm. 
I agree. Uh, I love what you say in the beginning of unlearning and learning and collaborating. And really, it is a global community. And we really have to understand what are the values of where we in sharing and how that, that kind of express and how can we bring community through that as well. So that's kind of go, go in, sync, in cycles as we start the conversation. Last, um, we are surrounded by creators. All the audience are people who are um, creating, thinking of creating their own business. They are creating their own uh, brands. They also, they're creative. Like we were thinking about before, the panel before that says a whole brain. We have the ones who organize and we have the creators. How do you advise, um, um, let's, as we have creators in the audience and streaming, what advice do you have that can prevent disenfranchisement and strength ownership? And I think you mentioned a little bit of that in the previous question, but uh, what will be the, that, that last advice? Are you talking about protecting your images or your brand or? Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> It's a big issue now, and you know, the internet, obviously, and social media. I mean, I think that some people tend to think because they saw it on the internet, it belongs to them and it's free or whatever. And you know, we have to educate those people. And I think, you know, we, uh, we artists have sort of you know, we've come together to help protect each other. And I have, a, you know, personally have a lot of friends, photographer friends who are like, hey, JP, somebody just reached out to me a couple of days ago. There's a punk picture actually I took that's on the back of a t-shirt. And I am actually good friends still with this punk kid that I photographed in, I don't know, 1979. And somebody's putting his image and it's not, it's not me on a t-shirt. And I've got now, help track that person down it's hard it's very hard keeping track of it and you don't want to go after everybody but you know i think it's interesting as artists like you you're an artist you're making <clears throat> art but you also have to have that business brain as well yeah. and that's always challenging it's challenging for me and in recent years i kind of realized the importance of it and uh for me i just and you know the community of hip-hop photographers people like martha cooper and joe conzo and i we we share vicky toback we all share information now you know actually contact high has been a huge um <laughs> instrument for collaborating and so we've all met each other we all know each other we share information and when people are you know for instance as a photographer, you know, wanting to pay me $50 when it should be $500. They're like, yo, they ask, how much are you getting? And they're like, hey, JB, you should be asking for, and we share, and, and it, it's a great thing. So I think sharing information, collaborating, obviously with your community is, is really good right now. The, what you just said about you all sharing is right. You know, I, I manage several artists and I work with many others by managing them. I get their emails from their website. I get their contracts. When someone wants to buy art, editions, you name it, we help them with everything or we advise on it. And some of it's all new to us. I've learned how to be a lawyer. I've learned when I need to call the lawyer. I've learned the four things I need to look for in contracts, you know, before I even waste time with the lawyer. Um, we've learned how to price jobs. And um, there's definitely an inside group often of artists where we're all talking to each other learning and asking each other what's what and why and hey did this brand hit you up or i get emails like i said from all these artists so like it'll literally be a cut and paste every other minute from the same brand asking the same question and i know they're hitting everyone with it so being able to share information is important um so many of the artists i know too that are successful have now built you know real studio practices they've built you know they have managers they have studio managers not everyone needs them of course but don't be afraid as an artist, if you're getting there to, you know, take the chance and spend on yourself. And also don't be afraid to share what you're bringing in because as a manager, when I'm talking to a brand for someone, the artist might be able to ask for, you know, $2, I asked for six, I settle at five. I'm still getting more <laughs> for the artist and I'm taking a piece of it and I'm making their life better. So that doesn't always work like that. But, you know, as an artist, don't be afraid to share information, just share sparingly with a trusted circle. 
And when someone screws up and uh, at, at a brand or someone else, you know, do your best to fix it and get some paperwork. Or someone screws up at a gallery, do your best and fix it. Yep. Right. Absolutely. I think um, you guys have said pretty much it all. You know, our art is a business, um, and what we do creatives is is it's the business of fashion for me as much as it is being creative in fashion. So this is how I eat, it's how I live, it's how I share to the world. So all of those things are important. My passion is fashion and being creative and sharing. But through experience, through time, through reverse engineering and just kind of taking the Nestle's plunge and then learning along the way, I've learned that well, I have to really stand on my tippy toes and get a team and treat this as a real business if I want to flourish. So, you know, having a manager, having a lawyer, having an accountant. Now, if you can't afford an accountant, you know, there's QuickBooks, there's different things, but understanding, learn, study your money, learn your numbers, understand, like, to me, it's bullseye, like having a bullseye from the door. As artists, a lot of us don't have that. We just are free and we love what we do versus knowing what our end game goals are. You know, so I think those will change along the way as we grow and live another day. But it's good to have them, you know, because if we have these targets, we can stay focused on our business and our art form and know where we're going. And, and because the world as artists, we can definitely take side turns because everything is so like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. <laughs> but you know what you where you're going, you can stay on that road, you know, and then having a team helps you even more. So I think those are things are very important. I mean, um, I'm in a an, an it's not private, it's a public knowledge. I'm in a lawsuit with another huge company now over an actual design that is, um, you know, I won't speak too much about it, but I decided to take a stand, you know, and it wasn't just for me as much as it was from seeing a lot of artists and particularly fashion designers, me being in fashion, um, this creative looting happened with drive-bys on social media and these big corporate establishments just really taking small designer stuff and winning, you know, and never crediting the other designer or even paying homage or paying them. So, you know, Dapper Dan would be a great example of that, right? So, and we can say countless others that have come, um, but, you know, I think the laws have to change, but if we don't advocate for change, it won't happen. So those are my things. Don't be afraid to take a stand. Don't be afraid to do the work and to, to definitely treat it as a business. And that means that um, a lot of times your work is going to be have to be more than just a handshake. Agreements with sign on the dotted line are important unless you're really here with people that you know and you trust, you know. But the first times out, it's good to have agreements and they could be a one pager, but it simplifies things from being like, oh, I thought this or I thought that, because that will happen if you're if you're green and you don't know. And I, what you just said about the, even a simple one page, when I mean, that goes from a graphic designer to working with a t-shirt company to a fine artist in a gallery, who's paying to ship your work back? Who um, all of these you know hidden things that can happen? I, I guess the, I want to add one more thing too. It's uh, so many times we've seen artists that we probably all feel like, wow, they succeeded. Like that's no good, or that's just repetitive of this or that. The reasons they might or probably succeeded was they were more organized, they had the infrastructure, they had the team, they knew how to work Microsoft Office and keep an Excel list of all of their contacts and who to reach out to and who to invite to things versus thinking the world will come to them. You know, it's just as much networking and being friendly to that random person on the street that might show up to your show or, you know, your lawyer's son more, you know, than anything because it's word of mouth in the end. And that, of course, social audience that's going to change, but that's all through the word of mouth. So, you know, being able to organize and keep people in order, you know, keep the business card and make sure you're inviting everybody to something is almost just as important as the actual quality of the art. Absolutely. And I want to add to what you're saying real quick, because my relationships have helped me to go to distance. So on top of those relationships, just be kind to people. 
because the same people you see going up in the elevator, you're going to see coming down. And it's the difference of them cushioning your fall or getting out the way. So remember that. That's completely right. And you just never know who's going to go. That's true. You know, somebody maybe, yeah, exactly, whatever, answering the phones in an office. That person could be a creative director who could give you work in a couple of years. You just don't know. And be polite to people, treat people with respect. And you're right, Roger. You, you know, you've got to keep those contacts and be out in the world. Because I think, you know, a lot of artists are, you know, in their studios making art and they feel like people should somehow magically come to them because they put something on Instagram. But it's really about being out there and talking to people. And obviously it's been challenging during uh, lockdown and COVID. But I think that, you know, that's, that's what social media is for and let people know what you're doing and just be out there. But, you know, April, this is a very good point. Yeah. Those are excellent Maybe. points. Yeah, this is great. It's quite amazing. We keep repeating the word respect and respect and kindness and, 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 and we go back to the same kind of values and where we are heading to. And I agree with you, Roger, we just need to be on the look like really always be ready and be ready to learn and be ready to fail and be ready to do it again. So I'm, I'm going to pass actually the, the microphone to Jessica because she's going to kind of lead the questions to the students. But it's been a pleasure to meet you. It's really been a, a, a wonderful hour for me. I hope you had a great time today. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for being and um, to really share all your perspectives and your ideas. What a, what a, what a pleasure. Thank you. You've been a wonderful moderator. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. For having us. Yeah. Great. Hi, this is Jessica again, and I'm going to be moderating the student questions. So before we get into the questions from the YouTube live, I'm going to ask uh, Eugenio Camacho, one of our very own student members of the our team, to come up and ask a question herself. Hi, Jeanette, um, April, I'm Robert. So this question comes from like the student team and is basically, you know, we want to know that like how you all three, you know, you're all self-employed entrepreneurs. So what was like that specific moment that made you know that you didn't want to work with some, like for anyone else, that like you wanted to have your own like company, your own enterprise? I don't know. I mean, for me, when I, I was always working, I was working in a kid's playground. I worked in a restaurant, you know, I always had side gigs to fund my art, you know, when I was first starting and, you know, and a lot of those side gigs were not even connected with making art, but they enabled me to pay my rent. So <clears throat> that's it, you know, and then it just gradually, happened that I could fund my own, uh, you know, rent and all of that with photography, which was a, a great thing. So it wasn't really a conscious decision. It was just, I knew I wanted to do my art, come what may and that. And, uh, you know, as a photographer, there's a lot of jobs that you take on that just will fund, you know, for instance, you know, I want to go take portraits, street portraits in East LA. So I need to figure out how I'm going to fund that. But, you know, so I go and <clears throat> shoot uh, for a school, uh, for a school, um, school book thing, kids doing science experiments. It wasn't the most creative, but I did that for a year and a half and it funded a bunch of my street portrait projects. And that's how it worked. <clears throat> excuse me and it turned out that the art director for the school thing turned out to be a great person and her boyfriend was a skateboard guy he had um Acapulco gold I don't know if you know that that brand yeah. really cool skate brand Augie. and I started working with him so you just never know where things are going to take you but yeah I think you know if you have to do side gig, side gigs to fund your art that's great that's what you got to do Thank you. Thank you for that answer. April and Roger. <clears throat> I, I never had a straight job in a sense, like from the time I was 15 years old, I was hustling something, whether it was spray paint 
uh, caps, the tips, the golden cans of paint. I was the biggest distributor of them for years. And that funded what I was doing to, you know, sure we would work for brands going and doing walls and murals and things like that. But it was always, you know, working for ourselves and it was always beg, borrow, steal, and, uh, use one job to pay for the other, you know, to go do one brand job for three weeks that you really like want to bang your head against the wall. But you know what, you don't necessarily have to put your name on it. And that's going to fund the next two months of what you want to do. And uh, just being able to keep doing that is, is what led to what I what I do. And, you know, what so many of my friends do. I think for me, I was, um, I was just hustling in high school and in junior high school to make money, to have money in my pocket, because I didn't know I was going to become a fashion designer by that point. But I can remember being in college one day and I was working at American Express part time in customer service. And I was sitting next to a woman that I admired a lot that was always fly from head to toe. And she was there and she said to me, look, this guy over here, his name is so-and-so. He's been here four years. This one's been here six years. That one's been there eight years. And if you're lucky, you know, this one, she's only been here 16 years. You could be the manager. And I just saw death, you know, for me. <laughs> I was like, I am not doing this. I am not working for someone. I'm going to figure it out. Because to be honest, I always saw this was me though. This was only my perspective and is only my perspective. It's so much scarier for me to put my whole life in someone else's hand for a career when I could build that career myself and make my own mistakes, win or lose, I'm going to own them. But the sky is the limit, you know, in terms of what I want to do, how I want to do my freedom, my art, um, my constraints, my lack of constraints, all of that. It, it's all got to come from here versus having someone over me or having someone tell me what can be done and what kind of budget I have and what the possibilities are. That was always scary. At that time, you guys have to think this is the 80s, working and then maybe working towards a pension or something in 23 years out of 25, they decide to fire me. That was freaking scary to me. So those were the kind of things that made me say, no, nah, I'm going to do this my way, you know. Thank you guys so much. We have one more question. We only have time for one more question. And I'm going to invite Annabelle, one of the students at the conference, to ask it herself. Hi, thank you for speaking so far. Um, when you were in a career path that is very like creative oriented and all about like your work and your art, how do you deal with like people who have conflicting views? And it's like, this is something that comes from your heart, but it's like, they're telling you that it doesn't work or it doesn't work this way. And is there like a sense of self-worth tied to your work? I mean, a really good question. And I think you really have to follow your passion and people, you know, it's just an opinion. People are gonna come along and go, you know, that that's not a good photo or, I, you know, I wish you'd done it that way. <laughs> I can't even, you know, everybody has an opinion. And if you are passionate about something and you feel like it's the right way to go, you just got to go that way, no matter what. And it's hard sometimes, but you know, don't be afraid. I would say know your why too. Like what you just said is golden, Janet. And I've been on the other side where as a stylist, I've taken jobs where I've had to work with management teams and the artists, and then as the stylist, and then the record company, they all have different visions sometimes. And you notice Jeanette being, right. you know, and you're in the room and you, you talk to them each individually and then collectively, you have to have um, enough respect for your work. Well, execute your vision but enough respect for everyone in the room to try to be a team player and pull something together that speaks a little bit to everyone to have a happy end product. So a lot of times on collaborations and teams, you might not oh, yeah. get a hundred percent, but 
Um, if you respect the vision, go in there with an open heart too, to say, we're going to make something great. We're going to, and I'm value the other person on the other side of the table. So I trust that in goal, as long as you're not giving too much of yourself where you walk away feeling like, what did I just do? And I don't feel good about this. You know, I think it's important to have that discernment. So I think that it's a life skill that will come as you grow and as you experience things, but you know, you have to get in it and, and, and your gut never lies. Listen to that inner voice and, and at least question your inner voice to why you're feeling that way and understand that. You, you just said something important with you might not get 100 percent, but what do you really get 100 percent out of? You put on your own solo shows and that you're probably 75 percent happy with what you did because you, what you could have done. But no one else knows what you didn't work, didn't have time to pull off. So, I mean, so many projects I've put out through the years, I'm sure you too that well, if there would have been this one more piece in this line or if that stitching would have been like this, no one else fucking knows other than your tight knit group of people and it's in your head. So if you walk away from a project and you're probably 75% happy or more, like you're winning, whether it's a collaboration or your own, uh, because the other people, especially if it's a collaboration or a brand job, like they might not be 100 percent either you're if you're if everybody ends up 75 percent happy on a collab project like you probably did good don't be known as the difficult artist in those situations be known as the artist that asks the right questions to get the results everyone wants that's really true and what i i mean i was really talking about your own practice but when you you're a work for hire and you're you know if you're working as a stylist or i'm working for a company and they want a certain thing that's, that's collaborating, you know, you can try and bring your vision and hope that they, you know, will work with you, but you're right, you can't be, don't be known as a hard, as artist, that's actually very true. Yeah. And on the other end, what you said is golden, because I think as create, creatives, we're in our own head too much, you know, and so you have to get to that point. And that's experience, too, where you realize you take yourself serious, but I don't take myself that serious, you know. So and at the same time, I respect what I'm doing and I'm doing it for me. So if you don't get it, it's OK. You know what I mean? Because this is for me and whoever gets it, you know, and I don't take it personal anymore. Everyone. I'm not going to please everyone. I know that, you know, so trust you. Yeah. Thank at, you so at much. The, yeah. At the end of the day, everybody has rent or mortgage or something to pay. So if it's one step closer to doing something, if it's a job, just smile and get through it. And, uh, you know, of course, if your integrity is totally challenged, say something to do something, but like, you know, get through it. And if it's a, a, a something with a friend, be more vocal. Right. 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 Thank you. Janet, April, and Roger, thank you so much. Thank the students for the questions. They were wonderful questions. Um, um, do you have anything, any last words before um, we close this panel? Anything that you want maybe to share or anything that you want to advise? I would just say keep swinging with AIM, scholars and creatives. Um, they have faith over fear in your art. And to uh, to to stay out of your head and to see that end goal and be that beam of light and just always think more positively than negatively, um, because that will fuel your passion that like positive thoughts and positive tribes and find tribe members that will make you stand on your tippy toes and stretch you versus uh cheerleaders that are just there to to fan flame you know you want to be around people you can grow with and and, and move with yeah i mean what, what everything april said is like totally correct and if you know if you can find a group of people to hang with that you know you can help each other that's that's a great thing and she's right stay positive you know uh, you know, something like graffiti in a sense you could look at it as a sport you know you're here to compete you're here to be the best but at the same time you're here to be a team player and help each other so don't get in today's world it's really easy to get completely infatuated with the things everyone else is doing you know of course be aware of what other people are doing but stay on your own you know keep it moving and you're here you know for yourself but uh 
it, it's 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 a sport in a sense. Uh, you know, everything we're doing. You know, we're all here to win, but you know what? We're not all going to win by ourselves. So keep keep your group tight and uh, listen to them. Thank you all. It's been, as I said before, this has been wonderful. I'm looking forward to see your collaborations. Uh, I know there's a lot, a few things coming up, so I'm definitely going to see this and uh, stay attuned. Thank you so much for the audience. Thank you. Have a wonderful time and wonderful afternoon today. <laughs>